What's up, guys? It's Chris from DMGH Podcast. Today's episode is how to get into law school. It's going to be a good one, so stay tuned. Three, two, one, let's go. Welcome to Don't Mind the Golden Handcuffs Podcast or DMGH Podcast. A place for future and present attorneys or any young professional to find the motivation they need to further their minds, careers, and financial success. It's hard to make it out there when you came from nothing. We want to provide you with some help with that. Of course, a one-person team couldn't accomplish this. DMGH Podcast's experienced guests will guide us on this road to career and financial success. First, let's take this law thing one step at a time with your host chris again we have pratik parik with us thanks for having me chris our pleasure as always today's episode is going to be how to get into law school um just for everyone to know this obviously depends on each person and also depends on each school certain schools take certain approaches that others don't so let's get started. Pratik, um, how did you get into law school and wh- or what path did you take to get to law school? So, I mean, I took the generic path, right? I went from undergrad straight into law school. Um, the, I guess the steps to get into law school are LSAT prep, take the LSATs, go through the whole process of applying. I think they call it CAS or whatever it was, where they took our, LS- our GPAs, compilated whatever it was, letters of rec, personal statements, diversity statements. Right, so why don't we tackle each one? Let's do yeah, it. Let's do it right. one by one. So first thing is go to college. Yeah. Go That'd be step one. You do need yeah. a bachelor's of some form or manner yeah. to go to law school. Yeah. And if you uh, don't have a bachelor's, can you, is the, what's it called? When GRE's, you, is it? Yeah. Is, is that enough? Can you do it? I don't GRE? know that answer. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to Google search it. I'm going to guess yes, but I could be wrong. For live time researching right here. So it says 16 law schools have announced that they will allow applicants to submit the GRE as an alternative to the LSAT. Maybe, it might be, oh, no, we're looking. We're thinking about something else. Maybe it's something else. All right. Well, scratch, <laughs> <laughs> scratch that. If you didn't go to college, look at if Google you it. have to. Yeah, Google it. I'm pretty sure you do. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you need a BA or whatever BS you need. Yeah, and then so you what major did you did you choose? So, I mean, I did the generic law school thing to do, so I went to political science. So nothing new there. And most people don't need to do political science. God, right? You can do whatever you want to do. If yeah. You're into archaeology, dance choreography i don't know what else is even out there scuba majors, diving scuba dive, whatever there's you a lot of crazy do. stuff now. you want to grow a farm that's cool you can do whatever <laughs> uh, you could do literally whatever you want to do and go to law school definitely true and i think there's a lot of advantages to doing other things in political science too i also did political science yeah. but um i kind of saw certain law students that had science degrees have more doors o- doors open when it came to uh i guess entertainment law or even IP certain law. Law, yeah. laws that do science yeah. and i was and i was very jealous of that because they were able to to enter those markets that are literally closed off to people who do not have those undergraduate degrees that's for sure i mean there's definitely certain advantages you get by doing certain majors i think i forgot who someone's mentioned it to me it was like going into those science majors also gives you a new perspective on things a science major yeah definitely a new perspective opens more doors but then there's also people that do like philosophy majors sociology majors where they have, they have a yeah. unique perspective to thinking so yeah political science is a common thing to do um doesn't mean you can't do anything else. Yeah. If I could go back, I think I would I- either do science or writing. I'd probably do business, to be honest. Yeah, that's true. Well, if I was going back to not pursue law, I would do business. Even then, I'd probably be, yeah, no. do my bachelor's in business too, probably. Yeah. I mean, I-, I agree in terms of what the benefits it could bring you if you're doing corporate law and business yeah, exactly. law. Exactly. But the reason why I would do uh, uh, either English or science is just because I feel like our 1L, there were certain kids that were English majors that excelled in the legal writing class a lot faster. I mean, eventually evened out. Right. But they had that first um, type of... Definitely helps. I mean, don't get me wrong. Writing an English major is totally different than writing legal. For sure. So but I think the benefit of going to the English major is you learn the syntax, right? You learn yeah. commas and periods Grammar, and everything else yeah. that you need to know how to do. Uh, whereas then all it's really learning the legal jargon and how to handle that. It's definitely. definitely a perk of being yeah. an English major. And I think science for the same reason where I feel like if you – it could be a, a potential safety net for you where if you're not doing, let's say, the best in law school, you still could enter certain fields that the kid that has a – amazing gpa can't if he doesn't have a science degree that's for sure i mean certain parts of ip law is restricted solely to science students and there's a lot of firms that are looking for kids to have that background and yeah. so it's definitely a market only open to specific students which makes the opportunity to get a job a lot easier exactly um so get your jd find your major you mean get your bi not your jd oh sorry yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the last step that's the last step uh study for your lsat Yes. Did you do a? Did you take a, an LSAT prep course? So I took the LSATs twice. Um, the first time I used this private one-on-one tutoring, 
let me tell you like it's a lot of money it didn't benefit me solely because i feel like at some point it got to a point where it just wasn't serving its purpose it was getting too redundant and so what i did my second time around when my scores went up is i spent a lot of time using these books and doing self-studying and it's something that you have to be regimented on like if you can't control your time and effort get a tutor go to these one of the, like group study sessions that they do i mean what i don't know if they call them or online courses whatever that's going to structure your your study time because lsat is, is a teachable test it's not one of those things that's a natural study test you can learn how to do game theory and you can learn how to read a little bit better efficiently or whatever the situation might be you'll just be better at it yeah. and so studying definitely helps and brings those numbers up i also my first time i did i took it twice both times i did a course I didn't like it. I didn't think it really benefited no. me, to be honest. I think there's a benefit to it for the first couple of classes because you're introduced to these games that... It's foreign concepts. Yeah, yeah, it's foreign concepts. But then after you learn them, it's to me, it wasn't really that useful. But that, that could also be because the program or the course, uh, sp like the specific company I chose to use. I've heard like really great stories about certain other companies. And I no. don't want to mention the company because I don't want to you know, right. talk bad about them. Maybe it was my fault, but I definitely did put in the hours and I didn't find that it put me or gave me an advantage. No, I think there's definitely books out there. And I mean, obviously I don't want to mention them either. There's books out there I feel like did a better job of breaking down how to approach these specific questions and how to take them. And it were really, I mean, for me, it worked out better the second time. Yeah. So I would say, but again, got to study, take yeah. those practice tests. You have to, have to, have to study because yeah. the better the LSAT scores, better chance of getting into greater schools. And if you decide to go to a, a lower ranked school, let's say you have better chances of getting a scholarship. Yeah. Um, and I did take it twice. My second score was also better than my first yeah. time for sure. And I, and I definitely agree with you where it's a lot about self-studying. I remember I improved a lot more when I went through each question again by myself and taught myself, why did I get this wrong? And that's much better than going to a class. Like I went to a class. So I went to yeah. a, um, I took a course, went to a class and it was about 15 other kids. Okay. And I think because of that, my voice kind of got drowned with the right. round and I couldn't, they couldn't focus on me. I think it's possible that if you have enough money, um, getting a private tutor would be amazing, no. but not everyone obviously. Yeah. I mean, I didn't that. find it too, too beneficial, but I guess the other question I have for you is, did, did you, you do a tutor? Did you do online? I did one-on-one -on -one in person. Oh, nice. Yeah. So that didn't help you either. I don't like it to be honest. Oh, okay. It was just one of those things where it's like, I felt like I was being watched and stared at. It's so like, I felt like the automatic pressure, the pressure. for me was just awkward. Yeah. Whereas like the LSATs I'm sitting at my, by myself, I mean, granted you're in a room, right? But like, yeah. No one's watching me. Like, Watch the pressure isn't good when you're just trying to learn. Right. Like it didn't help. He was like, yeah, go solve problem 9, 10, 11, 12, and I'll come back to you in like 20 minutes. And I was like, yeah. supposed to be teaching me how to yeah, do questions 9, 10, 11, 12. <laughs> yeah. Like I didn't come here for me to do it by myself. Yeah. Um. So it didn't really, you know, benefit me in that manner. But I guess the question I have for you is, I don't know if you talked about this already, but practice tests with the LSATs. I think a mistake a lot of people make is they go through these like study guides or courses but they don't take enough practice tests to get an idea as to yeah. what the LSAT's really going to be like. Yeah, get used to doing practice tests because that's also the most one of the most important things about law school. But I did a lot of practice yeah. tests. I think I took, if not all of them, close to all the LSAT oh, yeah. tests available. Yeah. I did all of them. And I also focused a lot on my weaknesses. Yeah. So like certain days, I didn't always take the full test through. Like sometimes I would take three multiple choices in a row take like a 15 minute break and then do like three game theories in right. a row is it game theory or is it game logical let's say logical, logical reasoning games, and then then logic yeah. reasoning um but i definitely did almost everything available yeah i mean that that's the way to do it i tell people all the time the one strategy i learned was like if you're gonna take a full practice test add one more section in there because the real lsats has that one experimental section which you yes. forget about and so now you're drained by five when you get to the real test. You don't know which one's the experimental section. Yeah. So it's one of those things that you'll learn to adapt over time. Yeah. But it's a timing thing. It's I forget how long the test really is. It's, but it's about, five, about five hours. It's I think tiring. It you're yeah. beat by the time you're done. Which is like the worst part about studying for it because a lot of times before starting the practice exam, you're like, wow, I'm going to be here for five hours in this desk. You want to talk about it's being sucked? I, the time I took the LSATs, the day before my birthday. Oh my God. And I was turning 21, so I couldn't even drink. I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm taking these LSATs and I'm figuring it out afterwards. But I remember I used to walk to my town library and before entering the doors, I would be so depressed because I would go in there when the sun is up and I'll be leaving when the sun <laughs> is down. And all to take a practice test, which could be nothing like actual yeah. test, test day in terms of my results. Yeah, it, that's for sure. Uh, what were your scores like with your, um, not the actual scores, right. um, but in your practice exam, were you consistent? Because what I found for me is that one day I would do great, one day I would do bad, one day I would do phenomenal, another day I would do okay. Oh, yeah. I wasn't really that consistent with my grading, with my grades, which I don't know is attributable to the attributable, attributable yeah. to the tests themselves. Like, what was your experience? I had the same that? thing. I mean, some days I was like, oh, I was like, did I really do this bad? Like, did I really screw this up that bad? And the next day you score on, like, on the top range of things. I was like, wait, something's not right here. But I think it just depends on the test. Like I tell people, just take them all. 
like you'll get an idea as to where you fall eventually you get consistent yeah um and then take that and i will tell you don't expect what you got in your practices which means your real score yeah it could be it, it, it could be because of multiple yeah. multiple factors come into play oh, like yeah. i know my test day at the tennis testing center they're doing construction outside Okay. And so we're sitting there taking the test and all you hear is a jackhammer go off. <laughs> like, it's one of those things where you just don't know what you're going to run into. And yeah. don't think, like, if I got a 170 on my practice test 10 days in a row, like, come test day, I'm going to get a 170. It's no, just yeah. not reality. Yeah. Um, I remember I was trying to think about all the factors that that could kind of pop up on test day to ruin no. me. And I remember downloading this app. It might still be available. It's like a, it might be an LSAT app or it might be just a test taking app. Where it makes noise. It simulated the yeah. noise you would hear, like <laughs> I that. writing and stuff like yeah. that. I remember using that. I tried studying in different places. Like I would take the test at Starbucks just because like. Yeah, I took at Barnes & Noble once. Because yeah. you have to get used to the distractions. Like people are going to be getting up all the time. Like yeah. we had one kid just get up in the middle of the test and leave. Like it happens. And like, yeah. so you have to be prepared to be distracted and be able to focus. And you're probably gonna be hungry. It's a five-hour test. You don't really get that much time. Yeah, yeah. I remember I ate a protein bar, and I think I drank a Snapple or something. Yeah, like nothing that. crazy. I was, no. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, to so take your LSAT, you get um, your scores back. Do well on it. Don't forget to do well on yeah. it. Um, if you don't choose to do bad. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, if you have to take them twice, you take them twice. Yeah, take them twice. There's yeah. no hard rule. I think yeah. typically they say you want to take at most three, but nothing saying you can't take more. Yeah. So, so one thing I've heard, um, I heard that this from my LSAT professor from that course. Um, but he's also older, so I don't know if it's applicable. He said that he didn't know this for a fact, but he knew they used to do it, is that the school, um, if you take two two scores, the school you're applying to um, can choose to see both scores, yeah. and that could affect if you're accepted. So if you go from, like, let's say a 146 to, like, a 170, the school might take the average out or yeah, kind of look do. at it different That's for sure. way. I mean, school could do whatever they want with it, right? But it's also important. Like, if, if you got a 146, 147 – and you went to, yeah, it shows improvement. And also, like, why not give it a second try? You know, yeah. it's not a bad thing to get a better score. Not for sure. I mean, like I said, if you have to do it once or twice, do it once or twice. Once you get your scores, I guess the next process is compiling all your information, right? Yeah. This is where it gets, you know, long-winded. But there's multiple steps to the, yeah. the application process. You have to hand in your transcript. Your so, undergrad transcript. So do you, you, or you also need, need your high school stuff? Uh, no, just no? undergrad. Okay. It's just well, undergrad. Your, your SATs, I think you need it, don't you? It depends on the school. Most schools didn't require it, as, okay. as far as I remember. But it's your undergrad transcript. If you went to grad school, so not everyone goes straight through. Yeah. Those transcripts. So the services there will take it and calculate it however they do it. Yeah. The new GPA that they determine. Yeah. You gotta do that you gotta get your letters of rec some schools will say i think two some will say three it just depends the letters of recommendation you could get that from professors so family, what i friends, hear or... is if you're not, if you're coming straight through it i think it should or must be from undergrad professors okay. if you've graduated and done other things it could be from employers that's yeah. what i've heard i don't know how true that is but that's what i've heard yeah that makes sense um the you, letters you're gonna need your resume also uh, I'm, i remember including that for when i applied to the school not now yeah some schools ask for resume some don't or at least it's an option to yeah i think they'll let you like fill in your like on the either they'll ask you to attach your resume like have you fill it in yeah. on the on the application process um personal statements are another one each school are, are those important yeah i i think tell people all the time look if you have the lsat scores and gpa maybe to your personal statement might not matter but what it does is it humanizes you right it's just not numbers it's your story yeah. And I tell people all the time, the best thing to write for your personal team is why law school and why this law school. Yeah. And so you can tell them whatever your reasoning is. Be genuine. Don't be making up stories. I know people do that. Don't do it. Give them a real reason. Like, why do you want to go to law school? Why do you want, you know, why do you want to go to NYU? Why do you want to go to Penn? Why do you want to go to Seton Hall? Like, pick your school. But why? And so make it personal. And that's what they want to say. So why, why do you want to come here? And it can make the difference. You know, if they're on the edge of should we take this kid, should we not? And they see, let's say, the story that they can, you know, resonate with or if they find, you know passion in your statement they might push you over the edge yeah yeah for mine i definitely took that approach where i made it personal yeah. and i feel like it definitely gave a sneak peek into who i am i feel like my if you read my personal essay for law school um you know me better than a lot of people who think they know me <laughs> right to be honest yeah. it's just it's your chance to tell, give them the story like i've heard from admissions officers they'll say like you have to remember law schools don't not every law school gives you an interview yeah so this is your one shot to tell them everything you think they need to know yeah so put it on paper like you know have someone read it make sure it's error proof like you don't want to have grammar mistakes no typos like it's yeah. got to be i don't want to say perfect but near perfect yeah. right yeah remember i sent it to my undergrad professors to look at and um give me their feedback and yeah. in terms of grammar and stuff like that I had them kind of look at it and give me advice. The more people you have look at it, the better. Obviously, your word's the final one. Just get it edited. Yeah. Make sure it looks clean. Some schools, if you're applying for a diversity program or requires a diversity statement, they might ask for one. It might be optional, whatever it may be. Um, you might have addendums, which are statements you put in for, let's say, if you were missed a semester, if your grades one semester were really bad, yeah. and you want to explain why. Or yeah. if you think your LSATs don't reflect your actual abilities, yeah. you'll have to tell them why. Or, or also explain the... Um, 
the LSAT grade difference between the first test and the yeah. second test as well. That's what the addendums are for. So, I mean, there's a lot in that. But, you know, it's a long process. And it's sometimes kind of expensive, too. I mean, I, oh, definitely. It definitely can get expensive. I remember when I was, I was in my town library applying to law schools and... The amount of times I have to whip out my my credit card <laughs> was crazy to it was me. Was a fee for everything. Yeah, there's a file, there's a fee to, to apply. There's like fees to get your transcripts. It adds yeah. up. It does because you have to pay the fee to take the LSATs. That's one. Then you have to pay the fee to use your services, the CAS service, whatever they call it. I think it's like ninety some dollars, like Jesus. And then for every school you release it to, you have to pay for that. Yeah. So you're paying nonstop, and then you got to yeah. pay the application fee for each school. Yeah, it's a lot of money. And if you're applying to law school definitely look at your emails that you use because I, I kept getting fee waivers yeah. and those came in really, really clutch. You could also go to the, I think they do an LSAC fair every year. Yeah. Where you can, I think it's done in, in this area, in the greater New York City area, in New York City. I think it's some hotel, in, I forget what hotel it's at. Mm -hmm. Every year they do, I think one or two, where if you literally go from booth to booth, some schools will even give you fee waivers there. Yeah. So don't knock them. Like they, it'll save you a yeah. lot of money. Definitely adds up. Yeah, I remember that. Man, I wasn't expecting to spend that much money. Like, I, I never thought you had to sit down and think about what you had in your bank to see if you could apply to, to a school, school. Yeah. so that they would let you pay them yeah, hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> I remember I started keeping track at some point. I was like, I had like $1,200 in application fees. It's like, this is ridiculous. Yeah, man. Wow. Yeah, so you, um, you, and then apply there and you wait until you get accepted yeah. pretty much from there and that's that's the process but the challenge is in that bit, in between phase right the lsats are done and now you're in that phase of i have to compile all this stuff what do i put in my personal statement do i need to do an addendum like that's where it gets complicated and i say you know use your best judgment if you think there's a reason for you know your grades not being there whatever that's going to help the, the admissions committee understand why they weren't there write it but again everything's got to be proofread no errors because there can be if they're looking for a reason they'll find one yeah and so make sure it's perfect and one thing that I did, I'm not sure as to how heavy this was with this was weighed when I applied, but I actually went to the schools and did the school tours and stuff. Yeah. And I was told that if you go there and speak to admission and et cetera, it could increase your odds. I don't know. It's probably not weighed heavily, but I think maybe if they're trying to decide between you and person X and that person X never even stepped foot in, in the school and you're showing a passion for the school, I think it can make a difference. I mean, what I'm hearing from people is ultimately it's not going to matter if you attended the tour, but I think the benefit for you, well, for two things, it's going to be subconscious, right? For them to say, hey, Chris applied and this is his face. Yes. Versus them being like, oh, just Chris from Livingston yeah. or wherever you live or whatever yeah. it is. The challenge is like, well, what do I do with that? Exactly. It's yeah. your face is finally there. Yeah. And I think also gives you the chance to go to the school. You might walk into the school and be like, I really hate it here. Yeah. Like I went to schools and I was like, I can't see myself here. Like, what do yeah. I do here? Yeah. And so then you automatically knock that school off the list. Yeah. And so there's that part to it. I definitely agree with you in terms of it puts a face to the to the application because yeah. you can tell a lot about a person by just having a conversation with them and seeing their and seeing them. Yeah. Um. You know, like their personality is going to come out uh, after the first sentence. And that's know. for sure. Like you'll meet people sometimes that kind of rub you the wrong way, and if they're on the admissions team, like it just doesn't show up right. And so I think it's the benefit of showing face, and yeah. it, it helps you too. Like it's it's a two way street. Like you have to be ready to go to that school, and they have to accept you. It's a two way street. So, like, what are the two most important, or I guess what are the most important things in terms of applying to law school? Well, in terms of getting admitted, I would say, I mean, unfortunately, I'd probably say LSAT and GPA. And I'd say after that would come personal statement. I think your scores are what open a lot of doors. Like, unfortunately, I, mean, I don't hate calling schools out, but like, the top 14 schools are really not going to look at you unless you're at a certain range of LSAT scores. You know, like, I forget what the range is. I think, like, Harvard is, like, a, their median score is, like, a 170. Like, mm -hmm. if you're not in that range, you're applying with, like, a 140, like, like, you're kind of stretching it there. Yeah. And so, it's really, like, your LSAT score is your GPA, and then your personal statement. So, that way, they know, like, it's a story. Now, if, without, a, you know, a picture, you know, anything along those lines, they have a story to read. Like, can this is his personal, you know, someone that's going to fit in here? Do they belong here? It gives them a story. So, I think it's those three things that matter the most. You know, extracurriculars, yeah, they help, but, like, it's not going to make or break your application. At least, I yeah. don't think. No, I don't think either. I didn't really have that many... I don't think I had any extracurriculars in, uh, I had one. in college. No. Yeah, I didn't have much. So I think also, I mean, if you're, I'm probably, you know, generalizing, but I feel like law students, it's a certain type of personality, like more likely than not, you're more to yourself, you care about no. your grades a lot, and a lot of times you can't do everything. But of course, there's always exceptions. Yeah, I mean, activities are great and all, and I'm sure it helps the college experience, but at the end of the day, like, unless you've done something crazy with these new clubs that you're opening up, it might show leadership skills, but it's not an undergrad application, right? They're looking for someone that's going to do well in law school and leadership skills help in law firm life, but it's not going to be the make or break for your application. So what advice would you give someone applying to law school right now? 
I would say, you know, if you're if you have anything else, that's take those seriously. Study as hard as you can. Make sure you leave nothing on the table. That's gonna unfortunately open or close a lot of doors for you. Yeah, and you know that's that. pretty crazy. Like that one test, it's unfortunate. Literally could decide your whole entire career. And I'm not trying to put pressure <laughs> yeah. on the person no, no, no. listening or anything, yeah. but, but it's, it's the truth, unfortunately, right? Like if let's say for example, we we talked about in your other podcast, it's if you want to go to big law, right? The idea is you need to go to a big university. You have to kill it while you're in law school. Yeah. In order to go to one of these big universities or the T14 schools, you need to kill it with your LSAT. You need to be in that 170 range. And without yeah. that, like you better be prepared to go to a smaller school, hope to God everything works out the way you want it yeah. to, and you kill your grades and work really hard and network and get that big firm job. But it's not common. Yeah, It's more common to go to these bigger schools and do it that way. And So do you feel like if you take your LSAT once and you don't like your score, do you think it's a good idea sometimes to just maybe take a year off or work and then try it again? Because I feel like it might be... It could be. Yeah. I mean, for me, like, I know my first time, I between my first and second time, I think I jumped, like, 10 points or something like that, mm-hmm. which, which is significant enough. Yeah. But I tell people all the time, like, I would at least take it twice before you give up on the LSATs. For sure. Just because I feel like the first time people have nerves, you're kind of putting a lot of pressure on yourself. Yeah. And now that you have a baseline score, like, you're like, all right, worst case scenario, this is my final score. Yeah. And if you're not happy with it, then you just don't apply. Yeah. But the other way around is you have another test and they're saying, you know, I felt confident, I did better. And yeah. if your scores go up, apply. If not, take the year off and study, do something else and try again. That first thing you spoke about is the approach I took where I, I took the LSAT. I wasn't that happy with my grade. Um, looking back, if I didn't take it again, I probably would not have gone to law school. And looking back, that would have been the worst decision of my yeah. life. Um, but I I took it a second time, but much, but with much less stress. Because I was like, you know what? If this isn't, this isn't for me, this isn't for me. I did a lot better that time. Exactly. So don't put too much pressure on yourself. Yeah. I mean, like I said, unfortunately, people put a lot of level and you know points on the application yeah. process to LSATs, but that's a big yeah. one. Like your personal worth is not your LSAT score. God, no. no you no. know, like don't ever think just because you got a bad LSAT score or whatever, you don't have worth. It's just, it's it's very, it's a very horrible way to yeah. you know, tell if someone's going to make a great attorney because, I mean, looking at, at my, the school I go to, you, you couldn't tell in terms of who did well in the LSAT because no. you had kids that came from amazing schools oh, do yeah. horrible in law school and you had kids that came that that have come from much poorer ranked schools and they're doing exceptional oh yeah i don't know if you've heard this myth and i don't know if you know anything about this is they say like your LSAT score correlates to your first year gpa yeah i don't see i'm that. gonna tell you like, my LSAT <laughs> score is that great and i i would like to say i did fairly well my one yeah. um if my LSAT score was supposed to dictate where i would be today then the whole system is broken <laughs> yeah, because I should work. not be where I am today. No, but yeah, that's why I tell people like, yeah, the LSAT scores are important, but don't let it define you. Yeah, because we're living proof of it. You know, like if your LSAT scores aren't the best, you can go to a regional school or whatever other schools that are out there and do well there. Work hard and dedicate yourself to the law school process. And you know, we both got jobs yeah. that we wanted. And so it's yeah, they're important, but don't kill yourself over it. It's a lot of work. I get it, um, but it definitely eases the process if you can get into one of these big schools and you want to do big law. How could you prepare? for um i guess the application process when you're in college like does it help to work in a legal job as a, as a legal secretary does it help like is there anything that kind of helps out like for me just like uh for me i i would suggest someone if you're a freshman in college um it's too soon for you to be like stressed about law school but if you have a cousin or a friend that went to law school ask for their lsat book and just do some problems for fun just yeah. for your mind to get accustomed to that type of problem and I would also say do your research, right? Like get yourself out there. Like I know during my experience at my undergrad, like I interned at the the state supreme court just to get an idea of how that works. It's exposing yourself to what you're getting yourself ready for, and you know it also doesn't help to spend time getting to know professors because you will need those letters of recommendation. You will, so, yeah. You know, start now. Yeah. It doesn't hurt as a fr- freshman. You know, talk to a professor, take another class with another professor if you're an upper year student, and build that connection because those generic recommendation letters don't do much for you. Yeah. But for professors sit there and say, you know, I've had yeah. this kid in four classes, they did them exceptionally well. Yeah. Now they have a great personality. They've been talking to me about their passion for law. And like it's more personal that way. Yeah. Rather than the copy paste print version of yeah. those letters. So, you know, network, talk to people, get an idea of what you're getting yourself into and start studying. Yeah. I mean, I granted sometimes it might be too soon, but all sets are important. Keep yeah. your, and the other part is keep your grades up, you know, as much as it's, you know, you, you're finally in college, you want to have a lot of fun and yeah. you want to go out and party. Your GPA is also important too. Very important. I, I I would agree with you where I would say that your grades and your LSAT are the two most important things. And I think with your college grades, it could be easy to mess it up. Like if you know a class is super hard, I'm not saying don't take it, but I'm saying be very smart with your class choices. Yeah. If you know you're going to do well, then then do it. Like I took a class that was very difficult and it was my class that I excelled in the most. Um, But you definitely want that high GPA or at least as high as you can. Yeah, it definitely helps the cause, right? Like anything that's going to make you stand out with, by the metrics helps. 
Yeah. And that's what's going to open doors to scholarships too. It's also like a, a safety net, like we said before, where it's if you don't kill it with your LSAT, your GPA might save you to a certain extent. It's not weighed the same, but no. it could help a little bit more than if it wasn't, obviously. Yeah, I mean, if you're walking in with like a 3.9, like yeah. it looks impressive. Yeah. You know, it's easier to do when if you have a lower LSAT yeah. score. So like I said, LSAT scores, GPA, network, yeah. build those letters of rec. So now yeah. you have three of the four, you know, three of whatever five steps done already. Yeah. That's that personal statement. But I definitely would say if you're like a freshman, sophomore, junior, I'm not saying waste your whole Saturday studying. I'm, I'm not saying no, that to any not. extent, yeah. but um, concentrate on your grades. And also just download, there's the LSAT um, practice like tests on apps. If you're a freshman, sophomore, junior in college, just download that and do a couple for fun here and there. Yep. Just because I think it's so important to get in the mindset. These these The LSAT isn't difficult in terms of the actual problems. It's more about time management, I feel right. like. So if you start at a young age, just yeah. practicing, who knows what you could get. You it's know? exposure, right? Like, it's those logic games that we haven't played since like, we were really little kids, right? Yeah. So when you're in elementary school, the teacher used to be like, you know, if Sally can't stand exactly. Smith. Exactly. You know, we haven't done those in forever, but being yeah. able to go back to that mindset and starting early on, like it's worth learning. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Pratik, as always, thanks for being a guest. Thanks for having me. This was great. And uh, yeah, everyone, if you enjoyed this, leave a like or subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Google Play Podcasts. Stay with us. If you have any feedback or anything, you could email me at dmghpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned. I hope that I helped at least one of you. Talk to you guys later. Morning dew for me to rake. Being awake, being almost me. I breathe sweet war in the air Vague trail of memories fair foot loose and fancy free